word of prayer before we begin. Um, Father in heaven, I thank you for this time to be before these men, my brothers, and to open your book. Um, we're all here because we're convinced that you have spoken, that you've given us your word in this book. And I ask that you would help me to be faithful and to proclaim your word and nothing but that as I'm here in front of this pulpit. Amen. All right. I'm going to invite you to turn in your copy of the scriptures or your Bible app to Second Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 3. As you're turning there, I'd invite you to consider another Peter. He, um, Peter Parker, Spider-Man. The thing that I love about Spider-Man and the reason he's such a compelling character is because we understand why he is the way he is. He has such a clear origin story. He, came, he became Spider-Man as a result of the death of his Uncle Ben. His Uncle Ben was killed by a mugger and they had a last conversation before Uncle Ben died on a sidewalk. He said, you know, Peter, with great power comes great responsibility. And believe it or not, when he wrote those words, Sam Raimi, who wrote and directed that movie, joined the ranks of uh, scholars of the uh, Catholic epistles, because that's actually a pretty good outline for our text right here. This is what Peter, the apostle, not the superhero, has written to us. Let's turn our attention there to verse 3. I'm just going to read the text and we'll begin. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, Make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All right. Let's take a look at this um, admittedly intimidating list of virtues, and let's start where Peter starts, with the basis for what he's asking us to do. How can we possibly be expected to do this thing? Let's talk about the power that uh, gives us this responsibility. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Just grammatically, it's important to note that God's doing all the work. We're the objects here. These things have been granted to us. We didn't do anything to earn them. They're gifts from God. Let's see. And he's given us everything. You know, we're in no way deficient with our equipment. He didn't give us most of the things that we needed for life and godliness, or almost all the things, or... Everything but these four things that you can get at Lifeway for five easy payments of 1995. He gave us everything. Let's see. And he did this through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. This is, um, this phrase right here, is, these words are datives in the Greek. So they could potentially be our objective. He could call us to do these things, or they could also be instrumental datives. This could be means because this one who calls us, because God is so virtuous and excellent, he can call us to do these things. Some of your translations will have a footnote there that indicates that. 
So this glory and excellence that uh, God has through this, by this, he has granted to us his precious and very great promises. Think about all the promises we have in the scriptures. Just, let's just be encouraged by the sheer number of them. You know, these, we're about to get to all of these virtues that we're supposed to have and all these, it's a very intimidating passage if you don't look at it in this context. If we don't pay attention to what Peter is doing right here in our own lives, we're going to be hopeless or maybe legalistic. We have two options. We can be totally without hope trying to do these things, or we can become full of pride thinking that we're doing these things on our own merits. So we, we need to understand this ourselves, but also as teachers. Remember our responsibility to teach people how to live godly lives. You know, a lot of the people in our churches aren't going to care about an instrumental dative versus a dative of means. But there are going to be lots of people that all they want from you is to tell them how to be more like Jesus. And if you don't tell them this part right here, I promise you, your ministry will be littered with ruined lives. So pay careful attention here. So through these promises, you may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire or lust. That's that word epithumia can mean both of those things. Um, okay, so these promises allow us to become partakers of the divine nature, which is sort of a strange construction. It's not very common in the New Testament. It actually forms the basis for some, some interesting ideas. The Eastern Church has this idea of divinization that they've talked about, and some cultic groups have taken this idea of partaking in the divine nature and really ran with it. Think about Mormonism in this way, that partaking in the divine nature for them means being a god of your own spot. But Peter doesn't really leave us a lot of room for that sort of speculation, because he tells us what that means to be a partaker in the divine nature. Become that way by escaping the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. So for us, what it means to partake in this divine nature is to become holy, it's to grow in holiness. You know, it's fairly clear here. So that's, that's the first thing we want to see as we look in this, look at this text, as we look at these list of virtues we want to see that God has provided everything that we need for life and godliness. So this is the great power that impels us to this great responsibility. We can, this is actually pretty explicit in the text. Look at Peter's transition here. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge. Okay, so because of what I've told you here, do this. It's an imperative right here. We need to catch it. We need to understand what it means. Let's make every effort. That pretty much means what you think. You're going to have to do some work. And we don't really even get to choose our effort. We've got to make every effort. Throughout scriptures, we see a lot of athletics metaphors. When you're training for a race, and you can see from my uh, trim physique here that it's been a second since I've done that. But uh, hopefully those of you who are a little bit more athletic can, can testify to this, that sometimes in, in the course of training, you have to make efforts that aren't exciting. No one likes to run stairs at 5 o'clock in the morning. No one likes to run up a hill, but, you know, it, it's clear that we have to make every effort, or to make every effort to acquire these things. The trade-off is that Peter doesn't seem to expect that we acquire all these things. He doesn't say, get these. He says, make every effort to acquire these things. So we're going to have to do some work. But there's grace there, too, for our failures and falling short of what we've aimed to do. 
So let's take a look at this list. Okay, what, what are we supposed to get? We're, let's take a look at some of these words. We want to start with faith. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith. We need to pause here too. Faith is the foundation. Looking at it in this way, it's very clear who Peter is talking to. This isn't, these are just good ideas for life. You should do this if you want to live a better life or be a better human being or these kinds of things. This isn't, you know, heavy handed moralism. What it is, is Peter's talking to people who know Jesus. So the first thing you want to know is you need to understand who Peter is talking to. These are people who have faith. It's the foundation for these virtues. So, if you don't have faith, if you don't have this foundation, you can't do these things. This list doesn't apply to you. Be like trying to fly from here to Oklahoma City by flapping your arms. It's going gonna, it's gonna to hurt. It's not going to work. You've got to start with faith. So this faith, we want to supplement this faith with virtue. Incidentally, this word appears also in verse 3. Who called us to his own glory and excellence. That word that's rendered excellence in, this con in that context is rendered as virtue here. It has kind of a range of meanings. And the idea is moral excellence. So we want to take this faith. We want to learn, we want to live godly lives. We want to be obedient to what God has told us to do. So pay careful attention here to the order. We start with faith, and then we add virtue. We don't start with faith and immediately after we believe, start learning a bunch of stuff, which and, you know, I know that's hard to tell a bunch of seminary students because that's how we spend most of our time, is learning things about God. But we want to pay attention to the order. Peter's asked us to live a godly life, to be virtuous. To that virtue, though, we do want to add knowledge. Okay. And I don't want to put too fine a point on it here, but I would like to point out that Peter actually uses two different words for knowledge in our passage, okay? The first one, through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, that's the Greek word epigenosis, okay? This one here that we're to add for ourselves is the Greek word gnosis without the preposition. And in a lot of our literature, they mean pretty much the same thing. You don't want to put too fine a point on it and say epigenosis is always this, gnosis is always this, but in the pastorals, in these particular parts of, of the scripture, so it would be Peter and James and Jude, these kinds of things, this can be epigenosis can refer specifically to the knowledge of God that leads to salvation. It's become a technical term in that way. So we have this already. We have the knowledge of God that leads us to salvation. I got that when I was four. I learned that I was a sinner, separated from God because of my sin. I was going to be separated from him forever, from Jesus who loved me and died for me on the cross. And so I responded in faith to what I knew about who Jesus was. That was my epigenosis, okay? But what I didn't know about, no idea about the hypostatic union, got nothing. Economic trinity, no idea what it is. I couldn't even spell it. That's gnosis. That's what we're picking up right now. It's the intellectual content of the Christian faith. You have gnosis about these things. And we want to learn about that. We, you know, Peter commands us to have some gnosis. So in our context, as seminary students, as preachers of the gospel or eventual preachers of the gospel, we can be encouraged that when we're spending time parsing every single word in this book right here for hours at a time, what we're doing is we're acquiring gnosis at the behest of God himself, and this is book. So hopefully that's encouraging to you. So we're acquiring our gnosis. We're working on this way to get this. But we still need 
to do yet more. We need to do, we need to have some self-control. This word self-control, it's, um, I'm going to try to pronounce it, do the best I can. It's egocratia. It's, um, at the beginning, reminds us, of course, of that nominative pronoun ego, I. And the end comes to us in the English language in our words democracy, plutocrat, someone who's got control. So we're controlling ourselves, and even in Philo, this word was used to mean conquer, which I really like. It seems pretty manly in this way, that we're conquering ourselves and our fleshly desires. You know, think about Romans 7. Think about that fight that Paul described. That's a little bit of what self-control is in this context. We're, we're controlling, we're, we're conquering fleshliness. So we are working our self-control, and after this, of course, we add steadfastness. We add the ability to bear up under. Because, guys, it's, sometimes it's, it's going to be, it's, it's going to be work. Um, the race that we've been called to run, you know, it's not, it's not a 5K. We're running an ultra marathon and losing toenails, you know. We're in it for the long haul, you guys and me. That's where that steadfastness comes in. Can we continue doing what we've done? So we're continuing, and as we continue, we need to supplement this with godliness, with Eusebia. And I did a lot of research as to, well, what is that? And it seemed important to know, what does that mean? And if you look, at the way this word is used in the New Testament and also in the Septuagint, you know, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, it has the idea of piety, of doing what is required because of who God is, of realizing who God is on the basis of the epigenosis that we talked about, and responding adequately to that, you know, knowing him and doing what that calls for. Once we have godliness, we can supplement our godliness. Isn't that amazing? Once we have godliness, think about that. The fact that Peter commands us to have it and says that we're equipped to have that. We're equipped to have godliness. We're equipped to respond adequately to who God is. What an encouragement to us that we don't have to go by the next Logos passage to learn how to, Logos package to learn how to do that. We've got what we need. All right, so we have our godliness. We're going to supplement that with brotherly affection, with the love that we have between family. And you know, we want to love the Christian family in the same way that the fortunate ones among us love our human family. There's closeness there and affection and willingness to give and concern for each other. And that in and of itself is a noble thing and a hard task. You guys are stuck loving me. Good luck. But God calls us to yet more. The, kind of the Everest of this mountain of virtue, when you make it all the way up the steps and try to take the pebble from the hand, is agape. The love that God shows to us, his creatures. We've got to love like God does. You know, it's easy for me to love you guys because you're my friends and I like talking with you and you've got things that I need. You have skills that I don't have. I enjoy your conversation and your company. But there are people I meet in my other work. I work at the Genius Bar. Man, I, I don't love them. They don't have anything I need. I, I don't like being with them. But I have to love them. That's what agape is for me. Agape is, oh, you forgot your password again? Let me reset that for you. It's okay, I've got the time. I don't know what it is for you, but it's something. And I imagine that as you're sitting there, it's probably not that, but you know what it is. You know what that looks like in your life, I'm sure. Okay, so we have these things. But look at the promises. Look at the rewards that we see for the growth that God has demanded based on the provision that he's given. 
If these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to have a fruitful ministry, this is where the party is. You know, people, I hate to cut into people's book money, you know, and hurt somebody's royalty somewhere, but this is what you do. You don't need to read a bunch of books about how to have an effective ministry. Do these things, and you'll be all right. So that's, that's our promise. But there's also a fearful warning. God's contrasting growth and stagnancy. Grover lacks these things, lacks these qualities, is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. When I think about that, when I think about someone who's forgotten who he is and what he can do, I can't help but remember the first Lord of the Rings movie. Our intrepid hobbits had made it to the prancing pony, farthest out of the Shire any of them had ever been, and they're sitting in this pub amidst all the smoke and the drinking and the dancing, and Frodo puts on the ring and disappears. And they heard out of the blackness a voice that said, you draw too much attention, Mr. Underhill. You've seen the movie, yes? And so there's a bit of a misunderstanding where Sam thinks he's going to, you know, engage in fisticuffs with this mystery person and save Frodo. And then he introduces himself. He says, I'm a friend of Gandalf's. They call me Strider. That's all they call him. But that's not his name. We know who he is, don't we? He was Aragorn, wasn't he? He was the king of Gondor, the last king. But he'd been living as Strider, as this guy who roamed about in the woods and was a better hunter than you. So most of what happened with his character throughout the movie was he began to embrace who he really was. And the end, the first end of the third movie, there are seven, as you recall. You know, the first end of the third movie, he's in the tent with Elrond. And Elrond says, you need to stop being Strider and take up the sword. Be the king of Gondor. Be who you need to be. And probably the most beautiful moment in the whole movie for him, you know, the, the most meaningful part of the movie, they may have even cut it out in the, in the short version. He, um, he's in this cave. As you'll recall, they're in this cave, and there's an army of people who once swore a great oath to the king of Gondor to fight for him. And then they broke their oath, and he cursed them with a fearsome curse that they had to live forever as pretty much undead. They were pretty much ghosts is what was happening there. And the only one who could release them from their oath was the king of Gondor. And so we get to this place where the assorted forces of evil orcs and evil elephants and swarthy looking men and all these guys are converging on everyone who's good. Everyone's in one place, except for the hobbits who just chilling out in the Shire and not doing anything that matters. So we're all together and getting ready for this apocalyptic battle. And it's very clear, good's not going to win. There's just too many people who are bad. And so Aragorn takes up the sword. And he goes into the cave. And the ghosts say, you can't be here. You're not dead. We're going to kill you. And he says, you can't kill me. I'm the king. And there's this moment where they realize he is the king. And they agree to fight with him. And because of that, the day was saved, and the battle was won. People who don't live holy lives in this way, they've forgotten who they are. And because they are, in their own way, living as Strider, living as somebody they're not, they're not maybe doing what they could. They're not being as helpful and fruitful as they could. And we may not have you know, the fate of all of Middle Earth hinging on any one of our lives, but our lives matter. You know, you're not the king of anything, and neither am I. But there are people who are depending on you. And there are things that God has called you to do that no one else can. And if you don't do them, no one else will. So remember him, remember him. 
So we have a promise, you know, finally, we have a promise. Because of these things, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you pro practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will richly be provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Peter was talking to a group of people who had to deal with a lot of false teachers, a lot of people who said they were Christians and weren't. So imagine how hard it would be for them to even know about themselves at times. Am I a Christian? Am I in Christ? What about me? Hence the list. It's an objective standard. It's a way to tell. It's a way of self-examination so that you can know. Not only will you be fruitful, but in the end, you'll have entrance into the kingdom because you have faith, and that faith has expressed itself in these things. It's a little bit like at work, I have the a suite of tools. I have screwdrivers and all these things, but the tool we need the most is a document they sent us from corporate. It's called the Visual Mechanical Inspection Guide. And what it is, it's an objective standard. I can look subjectively at anything you tell me as an iPhone, and about 80% of the time, because I've seen so many and taken hundreds of them apart, I'll be able to tell you if it's really an iPhone or if it's not. But even me, as well as I know how it feels in the hand and the feel of the glass and the sound that it makes, and how loud it should be and how the buttons should feel, I'm still wrong sometimes. Because I just have a feeling. But the VMI, it's objective. It has pictures and text and says it should be exactly this way. And because we have that objective standard, we can say with confidence, this is really an iPhone. We've tested it rigorously, and we know that it's legit. Or not. We can say, hey, this is not an iPhone because of this. In the same way you have this list, you can look at your own heart and say with confidence, I can see the fruit or not. So we see that God has provided everything we need for life and godliness. On the strength of that provision, he's commanded us to make every effort to grow. And he's contrasted what happens when you grow, the results of that, versus the result of growthlessness. And finally, he has an eschatological promise that when we get to the end, we're going to be richly provided for. He's given us everything we need, including entrance into heaven. So that would be my encouragement to you just looking at the scriptures, I know all of you want to do the most you can for the kingdom of God. And this is how. Do these things. And I know that all of you at various times have struggled with doubts if you're at all like me. This is what you do. Look at these things. Let's close in prayer. Lord, I do thank you for this chance to stand before my brothers and open your book. And I pray that you would use everything that I said that was helpful and help it to stick in their minds and do them good. May your spirit use it. And everything I said that clouded the truth of your gospel, I pray that you would just uh, let that slip away. I thank you for this opportunity and for your book. Amen.